The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Money GPS is an Australian fintech that has created leading digital advice technology to meet the unserved advice needs of the 90% of working Australians who cannot afford traditional advice. Users take a fully client-led digital journey with access to hybrid human advisor support across superannuation, investment, retirement and insurance topics. Money GPS offers a turnkey solution to financial advisors, helping to future-proof their business by engaging non-advised clients, enhancing referral relationships and achieving scale through a technology and personal advice solution. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I have the pleasure of catching up with Josh Pennell, uh, Director at Prosper Advisory. Josh, we're just saying before press record, it's been a little while since we crossed paths at some type of industry event or something or other. In a, in a completely different lifetime for you, we worked in the same business, albeit I'm somewhat in the same business, different name and ownership structure. But uh, Josh, good to good to catch up with you. Yeah, thanks for having me, mate. Yes, it has, it's funny when you think about it, I think you and I worked together about 12 years ago now, uh, you start to realise that the uh, the cadres are starting to get on the clock of the trust, so we must be at old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, someone else will say you, say we're both old, but don't don't, don't feel it in the moment. But uh, when yeah. when I look around at yeah now now the younger guys and girls going through professional year and all the rest, it's like oh yeah, I used to be twenty something years old and learning to be an advisor and uh, yeah, and fast forward fifteen, sixteen, seventeen years and here, here we both are. So tell so tell us. Prosper, Prosper Advisory. What what are you doing there? You, I, I think from memory, there's like an accounting arm as well. Like, can, can you give us a bit of a rundown of what the business looks like. Yeah, sure. So we, uh, yeah, Melbourne based, predominantly office wise and so forth. We're based in Bentley, so it's sort of locally where that Bentley Bayside Brighton type area. But as with a lot of people these days, with technology and everything, you know, we've got clients around the country. Um, the business offers, yeah, well, has two main divisions. So on the accounting side, it's really working with SAs and business owners. Uh, we've, we've said any business that's kind of got, say, five to maybe up to about 100 employees, um, that's the kind of size client we might have. Yep. And it's pretty broad in terms of the services. So you've got any business-related accounting as well as the accounting that might come with those owners at a personal level, so their personal taxes, their you know, trust, self-managed super farm, we've got SMSF specialists um, on that side. And then we also do you know, bookkeeping. We've got um, specialist business valuation experts. So it's, it's a fairly broad offering yeah, for sure. accounting space. Um, we ever do... Um, we actually do a fair bit of work in the AFSL space. So people who are running their own AFSL needing to get accounting um, and relevant support to do with their business, but also relevant to their AFSL is, um, I guess, a little bit of a specialty we've got and probably something we need to get a little bit better at promoting because there's more um, small licensees out there now looking for solutions on how they manage everything. So, yeah, that's a bit of a unique one. Um, and then on the financial planning side, yeah, we're predominantly focusing on pre and post retiree work. Um, we do have some clients, maybe say twenty or thirty percent, who look at it like a little bit more like you and me, mate, in terms of you know that sort of young family, professional, high income, that busy stage of life with, with kids and going through all that phase. But if we've stated like what clients are we sort of proactively marketing? Towards going forward, it's more your pre-retirees, yeah, um, and and retired clients, and then in terms of niche, um, having gone through a, a separation and divorce myself about seven years ago, I, you know, learned firsthand 
some of the challenges with, with people going through that event in life. Um, and so we, we do provide a fair bit of advice on both financial advice, but also business valuation work for people going through divorce and family law um, process. Gotcha. On that, that, that the accounting business side, side of the business, have you know as, as long as you've been there and involved, has there always been those different service lines, or is that kind of built slowly over time? What's the story there? Yeah, so that was the existing structure of the business. So I bought half of the existing business, okay. uh, and the structure it is that by half I mean that I own half of everything: the accounting arm and the financial planning arm. So. Obviously, like I'm under captain by background. My business partner is not a financial planner by background, and neither of us delve into those spaces at a technical level. Yeah. But we are both, you know, running business together and having relevant discussions around, yeah, the business, the team, the the ways to run the overall business, um, but not kind of giving any advice in those relevant fields. Yeah. Okay. And what what is the what is the setup of the business underneath? You know, you two as the as the owners. What what does it look like underneath in terms of staff and so forth? Yeah, so we've got twelve people in total, including myself and my business partner. Um, there's uh, six chartered accountants, um, and then so, you know, admin support staff. We also outsource uh, some of the uh, work. Um, Generally, it's your more sort of bookkeeping related type function. Yep. Um, and on the financial planning side, we're outsourcing power planning. And then we've got myself as an advisor, one other advisor, and then a client services person. Um, so, yeah, that's the current sort of structure and team. Yep. And the, the current advisor that you've got, was that a was that like a PY person that you've had for a little while that you've helped through that, or did you did you hire an yeah, advisor? Yeah, no, no, if it's even yeah. right to do that, yeah, even right before that. So joined us spent about seven years. Um, joined us in more of a client service type role. Then from there, our power planner left to to go and work in a completely different industry, and so that was an opportunity to get her into the power planning side of the business. Um, she then continued with studies and so forth, as well as learning more on the job. Uh, then did PY uh, and did that, didn't sort of rush that. It was like, oh, we're just going to get that within a year because there's also other learnings for her in terms of, you know, client skills and soft skills and getting involved with meetings and you know, mentoring her in those sorts of things. And it worked quite well for her as well as the business that we could just take our time with it and, do what felt right. So just just moving her to full authorised rep now. So okay. it's been interesting and quite rewarding to be part of that journey or and still part of that journey. Obviously, we're all always learning, but um, you know, passing on some of the learning that I've had over the years of different things that can help her with um, different things that come up. Yeah. Do you, do you think you'll need to go through that that type of thing again? In the not too distant future, or the two of you as advisors, that's that's enough capacity to service the clients that you're, you're looking after. Like, what's happening? Yeah, well, these things as a business, so yeah, it depends on what happens with some of those things we are exploring, and therefore how quickly we we might grow. Okay, and I've kind of got a little bit of a in my head. I've got a little bit of a vision of what the future um, organization chart could potentially look like, but. Uh, yeah, we should see where it actually lands. But I'd see, yeah, possibly maybe look at maybe something like a graduate slash associate to support some of the advice related work. So they're they're learning and probably in meetings and maybe writing some advice and and some of the journey that most of us have been on. At as if actually understanding the the industry and the things that are involved you know, at all levels of the process. Um, would would possibly be a good fit um, down the track. Yeah. Can Can you share any more about your your, your plans for what does the organisational structure look like? Can you, do, can you share any of that, or is it all still too fresh ideas? It's really just off the back of looking at like we're 
getting better at our organic growth and ways to bring in opportunities, but also then service those opportunities and make sure that that's a good customer experience and we're adding value and we're you know, retaining in clients and things like that. We've put a lot of bit of time into that. We've also put, put a fair bit of time into just doing things a bit more efficiently. Um, we started looking at a range of different softwares and things that are out there, but decided in the end to really hone in on just getting really good at X plan and not being too distracted. Um, and that's been that's paid off, but you know, obviously AI is the big current topic that might help us with efficiency. I, I definitely would say we're at the forefront of using that yet, but that's probably on the horizon. But yeah, in terms of your question, it's more about whether we look at acquisition right. and things like that as a as a way to to grow um, and combining that with organic growth as well as just running business more more effectively and efficiently. What what are you doing on that organic growth thing? Because I know as as much as I've seen of you from a from a distance, you know, I you used to go to a lot of the networking type events and mm. um, you know running your own seminars and, and 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 bits and pieces. Can can you maybe talk about some of the things that you've tried over the 10, 10, 12 years that you've that you've been doing it? Yeah, sure. The biggest one for me, and this is back before um, I was we worked to, the. Business we worked together at. I was there for about five or six years, and I feel like you maybe got there roughly about my third year, maybe. Probably. So this yeah. is yeah, probably a couple of years before we worked together. I and this might be useful for any younger advisors out there, or becoming you know, heading in that along that journey. But I've been in the industry for maybe about five years by this stage. I started as a power planner. I did an economics and finance degree. I did my CFP straight away whilst I was a power planner and then moved to become, I guess you'd call it kind of like an associate advisor uh, at the business we used to both work at, which at that time was called WHK Crow Orworth. And I was kind of supporting two advisors, doing that for a couple of years. But what I realized was that anyone more senior than me, the main difference was the fact that they had clients. They had their own clients and they were finding their own clients or finding ways to generate revenue and um, I didn't have any requirements or KPIs to generate revenue but once I realized that I kind of saw that that was how you were going to get you know progress in your role apart from by chance of someone maybe leaving and you inheriting a client base so yeah. for me it was about doing what was in my control to be able to advance my career and that's when I started looking around at yeah what even is there working I didn't even had that ever done it um, I think I was only about 27, so I was still you know, relatively young. And my career at that stage had really been more about the technical knowledge, like get my degree, get my CFP, uh, learn the on-the-job experience, um, and also building up a lot of the more soft skills with working with clients and the, you know, the relationship, the rapport building, things like that. So anyway, I started looking around, and the first thing I did was join a group called BNI, which is Business Networks International, which many listeners have probably heard of and many are possibly members of quite a large national group and then I also you know this was pre-kid so I had the time to do it I would go to a lot of just random networking events that I could find that I thought were relevant whether it be a breakfast to lunch and after work thing and just really get out there and find out what was going on in different people's worlds and how to connect with you know centers of influence whether it be lawyers mortgage brokers accountants etc and Probably did that for, you know, I went to a lot of things like that for probably four or five years. Mm. Um, and BNI was always the one consistent, stable one. And then once I pulled my business, um, I also you know, started a family. So my ability and time to keep doing that dropped off. Um, so it became a little bit more ad hoc. But I did keep going to BNI uh, until the start of this year. So 14 years I went to the same group. Same oh. chapter, you yeah. know? Same group and just really, yeah, just focused in on those deep relationships with the same people. Um, was there anyone else still there for like 14 years later? <laughs> yeah, there was a few. There still is a few. There's probably only about four or five. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so I got a huge amount out of that. Um, yeah, no, well over seven figures of outcome from that group over the journey. It's interesting you say that because some people 
know, the, whether it's BNI or Fresh or any of these, uh, these other groups, some people say, nah, no, 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 I haven't spoken to anyone that's stuck it out for 14 years like you have. So there's, you know, there's a, there, there's some credit for the, the longevity of you sticking it out and hence the reward. But it's, yeah. it's worked for you by the sounds of things. Yeah, it did work well. I mean, there's always an opportunity cost, like what? Might I have done at that time otherwise, or True. how else might I have networked? So it's hard hard to know. But it didn't just get me clients, and it developed a lot of other skills, you know, public speaking and a lot of other lessons from that as well. So that was the road I took. Uh, you know, it did work, but would something else have done better? I don't know. But um, I think the main thing is you, you do just, you do need to be out there. Um, you know, clients aren't sitting under your desk. Yeah. You've got to be doing something like I know you're writing to your social media. That's your avenue and platform. For me, it was a face-to-face events. Um, since finishing BNI, and one of the reasons I finished BNI was we have started working with a coach, and with that, we're focusing more on webinars. Okay. Um, and we're focusing that more in on that pre-retiree client that is on track to be, you know. Um, well and truly self-retired with with good amounts of money, so it's that sort of the level of client we want. So that's that's been something we've built out, and that's been looking promising with some of the early results. Yeah, how are you? How are you filling seats in the webinar? How are you getting people to come along? Is that existing clients? Is it? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. The first one was just using our existing lists, but our, our clients and business. So that was pretty easy. You've got them sitting there. Um, next one I'm doing is targeted at, um, a database of contacts I've got from the work I've done more with divorce seats. Yes. So it's using that list. Um, and then after that, it's more strategy around, um, getting my centers of influx contacts to invite their networks. And that's the way that they're going to value add to their contacts and clients by getting me there as a, you know, topical expert, um, and obviously I benefit through the potential to get clients aware of our services and and offer them services afterwards. So, yeah, I've lined up two of two of those already, and I'll okay. just try and make that a more a quite a consistent um, thing to be you know doing them on a regular basis. Yeah. So yeah, pretty pretty early days with that one, but as I said, yeah, keen to hear keen to hear from you, keen to hear from you another time how it's all how it all kind of tracks for you the the kind of the divorce and separation type work you said you know you've kind of maybe ended up in it going through those events yourself what what and can, can you talk a bit about some of the work that you're doing in that space with with clients how you're helping them yeah for sure so yeah it's obviously a even for people with an amicable separation it's a massive life event you know um, I think there's a set there of the biggest life events, you know, changing job, moving house, getting divorced, blah, blah, blah. And like, so this one's going to be very close to the top in terms of the amount of stress and um, things that can come with it. So yeah, it is a challenging time. And then like, people are often navigating an area that's, it's like having your first child. You don't, you haven't had any practice. It's just like, yeah, man, yeah, good luck. So it's a huge learning curve. It can be there's emotion involved, there's stress. Usually, one person from a couple who's got less financial engagement, education, knowledge, maybe less relationship with any advisors, whether it be accountants or advisors or whatever it might be. So they're they're feeling quite lost, overwhelmed, etc. Um, so yeah, when I went through it myself, I thought we all know the stats on how many people are going through this. I know how hard it was for me and how hard it is for anyone, predominantly, pretty much. And I know how much it needs to be worked through, like just the sheer volume of change and things to, to work. It was basically like tipping your whole life upside down, including your finances, and then having to piece it all back together. So that was the real, I guess, inspiration slash motivation for me to want to get involved. Um, usually people need a lot of different experts, whether it be an advisor, an accountant, a lawyer, possibly a mediator, counsellor, could be children's experts, buyers, advocates, real estate agents. Like, divorce requires a lot of different people's help. So my mindset was sort of like, how do we plug some of the gap and bring that actual personal experience to it? So it's not about, it's not about me, it's not about my 
to your ex or talking about that. It's just, but it's just being able to genuinely say, I do understand what you're going through. I understand the challenges and you know, how do we, how can we help you? How do we help you get through this? But also to be able to, again, not, not focus on this, but you know, I'm now seven years down the track in a new, not new, but like had a part, new partner for a long time now. We've got four kids between a splendid family. We've, we've bought a house. We've renovated a house. We've, you know, like life will go on. It will improve. So you can really can, I guess, set, really focus on setting a positive vision for people who are at a really difficult time um, and getting them moving in the right direction. Um, so in terms of how we do it, because we do business fee evaluations as well, it's been good to the other if we build relationships with referral partners there's a couple of different problems we can solve for people mm. that they might need so from a business perspective it's, it's useful because there's plenty of opportunities um but in terms of the actual service the thing i really doing was that our traditional advice model which is an actual plan doesn't really suit people that well mm. especially at the earlier phases of going through a divorce because let's say you, you do a plan and then six months later they've finally settled their divorce. How and what they settle on is likely to be quite different to what you discuss when meeting them and what you put in that financial plan. So now they need a whole new financial plan. Now that's a waste of time, energy and money for the client. <clears throat> so what I've done is really, I really give clients options about how they think it's going to be best for them to receive advice. So it's more around strategy based discussions early on to them they're trying to sort out and understand money. They're trying to consider is there certain implications of settling on something, whether it be C G T or their future cash flow position or are they leaving money on the table. So a lot of it is really just giving them a bit of support, confidence, clarity. So I normally really focus in on understanding their current situation and what assets are in the property pool that might be considered helping them to really make sure they're clear on what that is how it all works then i really focus on what are their goals going forward for themselves and if relevant their kids because then how what they might work on with their lawyer around the settlement is much more aligned to what they want to achieve for their life going forward yeah and then that can be a bit more strategic because then you know oh i want to if they want to retire early then all right you might be going for more superannuation if they're really focused on the now, then you're looking at other assets now that are more liquid or more useful for them in the short term. So, yeah, it's really getting clear on their current situation, teaching them some of the money and financial basics, let's call them, from an advisor perspective, um, giving them confidence, pointing to a positive future. It can be very overwhelming and uh, difficult. Uh, and being very goals focused, so that can be a little bit more yeah, strategic with what they kind of um, do with their lawyer. And then, yeah, keeping the lawyer up to date with the discussions you're having with them, sharing information that you've collated and put together, because often lawyers don't want to do that or they're not the expert at it. It's more cost effective to the client, you're not double handling things. And then, yeah, once they do settle, say six months later or whatever it might be, then you've been there in the background, you're obviously keeping contact offer support, help if they need more discussion. Mm-hmm. And then it's a much more relevant time to produce a financial plan because it's like I now actually, I have X. I want Y, not I think I might have X and I think <laughs> I might want Y. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I find our work really fulfilling because, yeah, you, you do really feel like you're making a difference to people when they need it in a you know, really challenging time. Yeah, that that wait, wait and you're being helpful with the property settlement type discussions, but then waiting until you leave the formal advice until you actually know what you've got is a, a good idea. You know, I do we do a similar kind of thing, not necessarily in, the, in that kind of separation and divorce space, but often we'll have people saying, "Oh, you know, we're we're doing this renovation on our house, and we've got X amount of money to go, and blah 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 blah." And it's like, you know what? Let's just wait six months, twelve months until your renovation's done. Yeah, and if you come back and see me, then we'll know exactly what mortgage you've got left, or what cash is left, or whatnot, and then we yeah. can do it. Because otherwise, as you said, you're doing a piece of advice now based on some assumptions around what might actually happen. But then by the time yeah. you actually get to the other end of things, it's it's probably not going to be the case, and you, you've got to start yeah. again. Yeah, big waste of time. Yeah, yeah. Something you mentioned before the um the AFSL 
like uh, accounting type work or what, whatever it is for, for <laughs> for sales. How'd you end up doing that? How'd you get how'd, yeah, how'd you get there into that? Yeah, so funnily enough, there's a business located originally close to us that we were they just became a business client, uh, business accounting client. Um, I think maybe my business partner knew the owner through kids or something like that. Um, and then yeah, they they had their own license, so we started assisting them with things that are kind of relevant and specific to the you know accounting piece for an AFSL, and you also got certain you know, ASIC requirements and things like that, and then fulfilled. So there was a bit of a learning and skill set there. Uh, then my own AFSL was it's a bit of a unique structure. So we uh, it's been around for twenty five years because we recently just had a bit of a anniversary. But um, yeah, over the journey, generally around about eight businesses have shared our license, and we all you know run it together, and we've got a board of directors and doing it that way. More recently, though, um, three businesses left due to retirement and selling their business. And one of those businesses had an accounting arm that had done the accounting for the AFSL for years. Yeah. Uh, so when that came about, my business um, took over that that work, which added to what we're doing in that space. Yeah. Um, and it, it is a bit of a unique area. I think, um, as I said, it's probably something we could get better at communicating and, and try to help others with now that we've had a bit of experience in, you know, with a few um, examples. But, mm. yeah, that's really how it how it came about. So still somewhat early days with it. Yeah. Definitely doing doing it across those two um, licenses. That's yeah, this is just a part of those financial planning type networks that you might might be mm. part of. Just there's there's more and more, particularly with the banks leaving financial advice, there's so many little licensees that have set up all over the place. Um yeah, yeah. So that's a business in itself, big niche niche of there. Yeah, exactly. I think the main benefit is every business needs an accountant. And if you've got an app that sells well and you get it all done in, in one place, it keeps pretty, you know, keeps it a bit simpler. So, yeah, that, that's how it came about. Last thing I wanted to have a chat with you about, you, you've written a book or two over the over the journey. Do, um, how did they come about? Like, what 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 have you what have you written? How long does it take you? Can you, can you tell us yeah. a bit about the journey of writing a book? Yeah, sure, mate. Well, it's only one book, so don't pop me up. But um, yeah, wrote the book. So a few years ago now, probably it was, I think it was during COVID um, and a bit before COVID, I did a course called Key Person of Influence, which some of the listeners may have heard of. Through Guru, they go by sort of go by two names: Key Person of Influence or Dent. The yeah, 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 yeah. I said, and and you got to like write a thousand words a day or something. Is that? Is that- yeah, and there's different things you do with them. Yeah. So the course itself was like, it was about 12 months. I'm not sure what they're up to now, but anyone interested in that type of stuff, just Google those names and, and check it out because I didn't find it a good a good course and value. Mm. There was a 12 month course and it's predominantly around growing your profile. Um, it's not for, it's not specifically for financial advisors. It's for anyone in any type of business or um, field. Yeah. But yeah, they've got a whole, you know, curriculum they take you through and um, online systems and everything to support it and there's a lot of things you were expected to do from that course but one of the you know probably the biggest ticket item which i don't know the exact stats but i think maybe only about 10 to 20 percent of people end up doing it is is writing the physical book um and i did a lot of things before writing the book but um back in the great days of of covid people might recall it became pretty obvious here in melbourne that there was a lockdown that was going to go around September to Christmas. And um, I thought, well, I'm going to be uh, locked up a bit here, so maybe it's time to commit to writing this book. So that's what got me over the line. Yeah. Um, and then through the ownership of another company, uh, which is called Book Builder, I then wrote the book through, I guess, a bit of a book writing program or course. Um, mm-hmm. And it's obviously still on you to do the work, but it does give you a pretty good framework of, kind of what steps to follow to write a book and how to get it done a bit more efficiently. Um, a lot of people start books, they don't finish them, or, yeah. yeah, that can be one of the biggest, or they don't know how to even get, just get started. They might have the desire to do it, but it's like, where do I start? So I found, I found that structure really helpful. Um, and, yeah, wrote the book. I think the book um, is about 50,000 words to give people context, which I think yeah. is 
200 something pages in a reasonably easy to read font. And that was actually a little bit longer than I'd recommend. So for things like business type or book by professionals, I think they'd prefer them to be closer to 30,000. Yeah, right. Okay. Because it's not really, it's not about trying to become JK Rowling and sell books. It's about people reading the book and then wanting to use your services. It's such a more the style of book you're looking to, to write for people like us. Um, loved writing the book, like the actual writing part. I enjoyed it. Uh, I'd get up early, get the writing done, just knock it out, have my you know, space where I'd go to. And I think it'd be a bit like a band, like writing the first album would be super easy and then the second album would be really hard. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, I had 20 years of concepts and ideas and thoughts that I could yeah. design that was the front of my mind. Uh, um, so that was fun. The part that's not so fun, as I guess, in a warning for people is, you know, the, the redrafting and the editing and the, oh, what color, what photo do you want on the cover and what photo do you want for your bio and all those little, like, crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Was quite. It was very slow and time consuming. It, was that all on you, or was that like with a publisher you did that? What? Well, I had the public. The publisher helps, and they they kind of do what you ask them to do. But yeah, there's a lot of them asking you, "What do you want us to do?" And, um, mm. But anyway, you get through that, and then it's a pretty cool feeling when the other book finally arrives. And in terms of the outcomes from it, from those who are thinking about writing a book, yeah, just keep in mind it's not about making money off selling books it's more about ways to generate more client opportunities more ways to profile build trust uh be seen as the go-to person in your you know, busy professional people with um kids and things like that so that middle stage busy middle stage of life uh, juggling a lot of things across work parenting mortgage maybe the school fees uh maybe even get that point where you're kind of looking after aging parents as well so it's, it's that real like period where you feel responsible for everyone else and yeah. with some time to make for yourself uh so it's called what parents want and yeah it's been a really uh, probably the most rewarding thing was random people messaging me saying oh i read your book or i read this chapter of your book and it's really helped me with this problem or do it help us get moving on doing something so we've had to cut that episode a little bit short. Josh, maybe you can jump into the comments of some of the areas where this podcast is uh, is, is published, LinkedIn and, and, and other places. If you could maybe finish off your comments there. We're just, just finishing off there with your final comments on how you've found people kind of reaching out to you, whether it's just some nice comments through various platforms or people actually reaching out to be clients. Thanks, Josh. Hopefully uh, you enjoy this episode. Bye.